Hi, my name is Claire Izakacha, and I'm the founder of Clecker's Foundation, a non-profit organization that caters for kids. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewanfo, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now, let's get started with this episode. I was born in Lagos, born and bred, actually. So um, I think by Thursday, I'll be seven years in Lagos. <laughs> Good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So you'll be, you'll be enjoying the commercial city of Nigeria. <laughs> it's, 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 really, it's really hustling and bustling here. Sometimes I just feel, oh, can't I just, you know, go to Abuja and stay and rest or something? You know, I mean, it's, it's all fine. I grew up here, so it makes me. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So how is Lagos today to start with? Um, beautiful weather. It's not rainy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. It's not cloudy either. So we have beautiful weather. Today's Monday, start of the new <sighs> week, and everyone is fine. Fully charged. <laughs> yes, <it is>. yes. <laughs> okay. So you grew up in Lagos. Tell me, what do you see around you in your childhood? Give us some. Get us jealous a little bit. Ah. Okay. So. I grew up in a very beautiful um, place called Williamsley out in Lagos. It's in Akonjo. Um, for a long time, I, I I was the only child, so I enjoyed my parents. I did. So it was fun. My school was close to where we lived, so it was just a walking distance from home to school. Or there, I still had people who would come pick me up, take me to school, and all of that. But it was really fun. It was fun because, um, I mean, I just, I, I think I had everything I wanted or I needed as a child. You know, um, as much as I didn't come out to play so much with my mates, but it was fun. It was really fun. I, I learned a lot of stuff from my parents. And when I'm upstairs at the balcony, I see my my friends or my mates playing downstairs and I laugh with them from upstairs, you know. <laughs> you know, so I didn't do so much of, you know, the kids playing when I was little. But I mean, it was fine. So I had the opportunity when I was in school. So during breaks, although I was really scared of almost everything, I didn't want to play so much so I don't get hurt. I did not want to, you know, get myself injured. I didn't want pain. So I was so scared of certain kind of um, activities in school. I didn't use the, uh, what's it called? Those um, merry-go-round and all of that. The certain things I didn't play with. But then I still had fun. That's good. That's good. So uh, was it um, your choice? Uh, Was it your own making that you didn't want to play with the children around you? Or is it part of the urban setting? in Nigeria because now we're trying to understand also ourselves. Okay, so I think it's an individual parenting skill my mom had and my dad. So, you know, they would rather I'm upstairs, but once in a while I would go downstairs, but at a particular time I'm meant to come upstairs. So maybe they were also scared of injury or they were also scared of, you know, relating with other people and not sure, you know, their backgrounds and all of that. So I don't get to pick up bad habits, you know. I mean, anyone can pick up bad habits, even in the house, you know, but sometimes we just try to trade with caution. So I guess that was just an individual parental skill. Um, now, you know, as we are, um, okay, this podcast, we talk to different people, even those that I grew up in a village setting, because me, I grew up in a village setting, so I can, I can relate very well where people maybe tell me how they used to be free and live, uh, uh, that kind of lifestyle, you know. The other day, I was interviewing uh, my eldest brother's wife, so we started to talk. Uh, but uh, how are the children now? So she was telling me, well, those kind of life that we live then, you can't have it anymore. Because now, of course, the house is built. There is a big fence around it in most of the places, no? uh, which, of course, uh, this is it also exemplify how the society is, uh, is structured today. There is fear, there is insecurity everywhere. Because then, I was just talking to my wife before we started this interview, you know, talking about uh, that um, African um, Nigerian setting at the, at the time, yeah. that the, the way houses were built was, this house built, uh, then there is a space between the house and the other house, then at the other house again, and in this uh, connection, there is no boundary, sure. it's an open space, sure. so which means the children now from house A can play into the house B, 
and everybody is just having fun together. But that we have lost it now, at least in most of the cases. So that is why I was actually trying to understand there if, um, because even there too, there are some children who they want to to go out uh, and play with with other children, no? But in most of the cases, we were just roaming all around, doing all sort of fun, jumping into the bush, and we did a lot of <laughs> a lot of crazy things, no? Yes. <laughs> so in, in in Lagos, that is you cannot guarantee that is not a possibility, no? I I I can imagine that, right? No, I think I think there is a possibility of you know having such you know um, communication with one another. There are, there are houses, there are places where there are no boundaries, like you say. So it's an open place where people just move. You know, you can get into the compound, and then there are compounds that are really large. You know, so you have so many people living in there. So you meet maybe almost twenty kids there, and then you have to play. You know, that's it. You have to play. That is important. All right, Claire, tell me, how did you get into uh, the film industry? Because, you know, Nigeria, having created Nollywood, it become very vital. So we're going to spend some time there just now. But first of all, tell me, how did you get into uh, the film industry? Okay, so um, I had always loved to be on um, the back side you know like um, be the crew member be on the other the, you know like behind the camera i'd always wanted to be able to give constructive criticism and not just open my mouth to criticize i would always love to read scripts and say oh i think this should be done this shouldn't be done and all of that so luckily i have a cousin Subi charles may who is a director he's in canada currently and um, at the time he was in nigeria he would send me scripts and say oh read and drop your corrections you know and um you know it it was fun it was fun at the time i was a broadcaster I was working in a radio station for Lakes Dora Queenly in Enugu State. Um, so it was it was um, a side thing I was doing, um, and it was really interesting, you know. So I left broadcasting at some point, and I told my cousin, you know what? It's time for me to learn filmmaking. I want to learn on the U. And then that was how it started. So it was easy peasy for me. I didn't have to go through anyone or cut corners or all of that. So it was easy for me. It was just an open door to Nollywood. Like, hey. And the first thing I did was to produce my own movie um, alongside my cousin. He was a director and the co-producer with um, some other girl, Shay Hunter. So it was really fun. Um, I mean, knowing the fact that the first movie I did went to cinemas, the title is Gone Grey, and um, it was my first, <laughs> it was my first baby in Hollywood, you know, and um, it was an interesting one. It was really interesting. That's lovely. All right, so how do you feel uh, being there in this uh, glamorous um, uh, space, you might call it, no? Okay, the Hollywood style of Nigeria, no? But this is our own. This is the Nigerian style of of storytelling how do you feel be part of that uh, mechanism um it's amazing you know because there are a lot of people in the industry who are doing super super dope things you know gonna the days where you have few people who you know you know these people as writers you know these people as directors you know these people they're just few people you can pick but now there are quite a number of them and then for creatives it's challenging you know, it makes you get to your toes. It makes you get on your toes and you know that you need to work. You know that uh, you need to actually put your best because there are one million people who will bring out amazing stuff and they can compete with you. So gone are the days where you know that, or if you if you see a movie from so, so, so person, you know that, oh yes, it's a movie to watch. And then others can just be. But now you're watching 10 movies back to back and you're seeing beautiful um, cinematography you're seeing beautiful camera movements you're seeing beautiful costume every department is on point so you're hearing oh this is from this production this is from this production and you're asking who are these people you know so it's really amazing and then when you have a team you work with you know and then you decide to build with them it's even more amazing. So I've worked with different people and um, for two years now, I think I've been working with a particular director and he's been super amazing. His name is Director Chini Duben and he has pushed me, you know, beyond what I, I would have ever imagined I could do, you know. 
I used to work as a production manager on sets. And then I started working as an AD for people. You know, I directed a few short films. And that's because they are topical movies. And then they have to do with my NGO. So it's me speaking for kids. It's me trying to create awareness through a short film. But for feature films or documentaries or commercials, it's also an amazing one. And so far, I would say, not an easy one, but we're good. And it appeared that uh, Lagos is also... Um uh, sort of very attractive to the film industry you now because because of the population because of the market and also because of the money is it is it is it like that yes no contest <laughs> <laughs> no contest <laughs> i've worked i've worked in the east and you know i'm like mm, okay i'll go back to lagos <laughs> and, I, and i was in abuja um Last year, I think I spent about four or five months. I needed a recess. I needed to find out if relocation was it for me at the time. There were a lot of maybe ifs and all of that. So, and you know, I met with quite a number of people, and I can tell you for sure that the film industry thrived more in Lagos. No contest. Uh, everything is more in Lagos. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right. So, so what is your main area of concentration in the film industry? Now we know how you get there. Now we know you have also done a couple of things there. But what is your main area of concentration in the film industry? Okay. So my strength, a hundred percent, is management. I know how to manage people very well. I have good interpersonal skills. Um, then I also work as an assistant director because um, I. I, I learn I love to work with the actors. I love to um, you know put in my creative capability there. So I, I I've recently been working with a director, a particular director who has given me that freedom to express myself. You know, so sometimes we need to take some shots or before we're trying to prepare for the next scene, he's trying to get my opinion about something during pre-production. We're talking about shots. You know, so it's interesting to know that I'm being involved in, you know, directorial roles. You know, maybe I've not been able to say, oh, I'm a director because I still need a long time to learn. But I think this is a growing, you know, process for me. And I'm enjoying every bit of it, making mistakes for now, correcting myself, learning, unlearning, relearning. So it's been an amazing ride so far for me. Now, for somebody who do not yet understand the power of the Nigeria film industry, what do you think people should know about, about Nollywood? Um, I would love for them to know that we are growing. We have been growing. We will keep growing. Rome wasn't built in a day. And if we want, in all fairness, if we want to be fair to ourselves, we have grown. Fame is a tool to change. Fame is a tool to create memories, to create pictures, to tell stories, to create awareness. It might be told in different ways and different forms. Appreciate the hand of work that has been put into it. We don't have um, a lot of backings or fundings from people to conveniently shoot movies. A lot of times it feels like we're doing nonsense because, oh, um, in their words, how much it costs them if they do this one, waiting then they do, you know, and all of that criticism. We are trying, you know, someone wants to tell a story and probably doesn't have so much, but needs to tell that story for the want of time. You know, sometimes there's a story that is, you know, in your mind that you just feel you need to say it out because if you don't let it out, you don't know what will happen. You just want to say it. Sometimes there are personal stories you need to share. You might not even have to necessarily tell your crew members or cast that this is a personal story you need to share, but you just want to let it out. And with the little you have, you make magic. So that's, it still boils down to creating teams that can help you, you know, make things come out well. So with a little budget, you can still create magic. Nollywood is growing. Nollywood will keep growing. You know, you can't compare Nollywood to Hollywood. I think it's just the very wrong thing to do. You know, I mean, we bring out a movie and then see Blood Sisters, for instance. Check out the costumes. Check out um, um, the cinematography. 
check out the picture quality of the movie. Check out the stars that were in, in, in the movie. Check out, I mean, we may not have it 100%, but we also know that there are movies, you know, we watch American movies or whatever movies we watch, and then there's mistakes. You know, even the big movies have some loopholes here and there. Do we complain about them sometimes? No, we don't. But do we complain about Nollywood movies that have spent millions that they are trying to get? Oh, yes, we con We don't just complain. We condemn, we criticize and all of that. It doesn't help us grow. But the good thing is that we keep moving. So I just really hope people understand that it's a growing system. You know, I, I, I hate to engage with people about Nollywood, especially people who are mediocre in it or who have shallow minds or who just don't even want to think towards our own side and imagine what we go through knowing that you have to pay for all locations you need to rent almost every single thing you need to pay you know to use certain spaces even spaces that do not belong to these people you need to settle them if you don't settle them you don't use those locations you don't use those props you know, so it's a lot we're going through and we're still in the process of learning. We're still in the process of growth. So I think it's really wrong to compare Nollywood to Hollywood or to any wood, really. I think it was 2007. Uh, I was uh, part of um, a team here in Verona, the city where I live, at the Verona International Film Festival. So uh, we invited a guy uh, by the name Franco Saki. Mm -hmm. At the time, he has done a documentary on, on Nollywood documentary was called i think uh, this is nollywood and of course he was showing it because he came from los angeles so he was showing this film because he felt that it was really fascinating how nigeria were making movie and uh, so of course he was here and we talked a lot about the his own impression what he feel about the the country the industry this nascent industry in in filmmaking because just like somebody was sleeping suddenly nigeria came up and it became the, the second in the world in terms of full, uh, uh, film production. That is something incredible. That can only happen with a lot of finance, a lot of money being pumped into industry. Yeah. But Nigeria managed to do magic. How did they do that? I mean, can you tell me a little bit, how does it work in Nollywood? <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I just feel God, God bless us with talents that we are not even aware of. You know, because you see us use certain budgets to create certain magic and you're asking how, <laughs> you know, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes when we're doing budget breakdown, my director is saying, how is this even possible, Claire? I said, let's do it. We can, you know. So um, the first thing, like, um, you know, every other person will do is to ensure that during pre-production, you get everything right. So it's in pre-production, you honestly tell yourself and your team, will this work? It's in pre-production, you get to talk to them and tell them, this is the amount we have. Can we work with this? It's in pre-production, the light guy is trying to ensure that, okay, we may not be able to get all the lights, but we can work with this and this. Same pre-production, the costume is saying, I have a problem with this, 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 but let's see how we can walk around it. I could get a few people to give me for free. You know, so we don't have so much, but in the little we have, we try to make sense out of it. We try to make something out of it to put smiles on the faces of our viewers and our critics. You know, so um, the magic we do is even beyond us. Because I know sometimes when producers are done, they ask themselves, how, how, did, it, how, how did it even happen? You know, because <laughs> you, know, you know sincerely that, hmm, mm -mm, nah, I couldn't have done this, you know, but it happened. So we just have some supernatural powers we are yet to discover. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you see, I've also listened to some people who have been very uh, critique of the Nollywood film because maybe they are talking of quality and things like that. But I often say, well, if the question is quality, then quality is going to come with time. Because if we are expecting quality, maybe Nigeria will make one film. If you make one film, no matter how popular it is, it's not going to really uh, stand up in the market. Uh, because one, one doesn't really hold anything. You know? But we are not talking of number. And what number does is that it leads to a lot of because if we make one film, no matter how so successful it will be, maybe it will employ two or three people. Okay, let's say we employ fifty people or one hundred people. No, 
But Nollywood is employing millions, millions of different things that are, that are involved in it. So a lot of people, a lot of Nigerians are getting employment. People are now studying filmmaking. People are now becoming expert in, in audio. People are now beginning to become expert in script, in how to become a professional script writer, in how to tell story, how to stay in front of the camera and really do the magic. So all this really open up the Nigeria economy, at least in my own view, in very many ways that maybe producing one quality film would not be able to do. I don't know if you remember this uh, uh, this film. Okay, we can call it film. I'm talking of actually audio narration and that was happening then. Film like um, with the Kokuri, Zebodaya, you know, yes. about those things. Yes. So I I'm looking at the, the power of narration now. Mm. Uh, so that irrespective of what uh, people might, might complain about, might talk about in terms of uh, quality and uh, things like that, I, I want to believe that in Nigeria that this power of storytelling that is enshrined in the people. So what I'm really driving at is what is really moving the industry? Is it the story itself or the quality? A good story will capture any audience. You know, so um, it's the story that would keep you there. A lot of people are not concerned about technicality, except we filmmakers and a few people who understand maybe, you know, the technicalities in movies. But the storytelling will keep you there. The storytelling is what made us love Checkmates. Storytelling is what made us love Zebrudaya, New Masquerade. Storytelling is what made us love Things Fall Apart. Storytelling is what made us love Palace and all the series we had back then. It wasn't the picture quality at the time. It was. It has never been. It's the story that keeps you, you know, wanting for more. Why do we want to see Blood Sister season two? Because we need to do a follow up on why Kate Henshaw was kiss um, was kissing her son, you know, in, um, on the lips. We need to understand what Zakoji's presence meant. We need to understand if they would eventually do anything to any of the girls that killed her son. It's a story. It's not the picture. It wasn't the camera movement we're interested in. It's the story. Now, another thing that I really find very fascinating about the Nigerian film industry is that it has become a force for rec to reckon with among many diaspora. We are talking of Africans in the diaspora in Brazil, up to 100 million Africans there in yeah. America, in Britain, in Canada. Mm -hmm. Many of them would ever probably heard of this culture that have been portrayed, but yet, I, I was talking to uh, a, a Ghani, uh, no, a Kenya uh, copywriter a couple of days ago. I was interviewing her. I was asking her something about Nigeria, and she told me that she basically copying how things are happening in Nigeria. This is the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. She have never been to Nigeria, no. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing, what I'm beginning to see here is that. There is a huge power here that the people have managed to, to find. I mean, the Nigerian storyteller, the Nigerian filmmaker in this case. Tell me, I want to understand more about this power. How did it start? You know, you know what they say about um, pictures? Pictures tell a lot of stories. And when you introduce motion, motion pictures, that's what we call film. That's what we call film. If you introduce motion pictures, it can be compelling. So it depends on what you want to say. It can be compelling. It can be comic. It can be tragic, but when you bring out motion pictures and then back it up with a good story, you know, you find people who can relate more to these stories you're saying. So a lot of times uh, when you make compelling stories, that's why you see people in the cinemas crying, not because they're emotionally drawn to that particular story, but probably it's taking back, taking them back to either things they have gone through or things they know people have gone through, you know, or just emotionally inclined to the story. Do you understand? So storytelling is one thing, but when you back it up with pictures, when I mean pictures, I mean motion pictures, it's, it sends a different kind of, um, uh, what's it called? A different kind of feeling you know, to whoever it is that is watching. I did documentaries um, a while ago for Chino Achebe, for Late Dora's parents, for PN Okeke, um, and for someone else who probably doesn't have, you know, that figure out there. But I could tell you that sometimes when then, when I was, you know, rehearsing for this, 
I had tears in my eyes because they were all compelling write-ups. These are stories of real people that I was delivering and they were backed up with pictures. They were backed up with memories and it made a lot of sense to sense to me, the narrator. So I can imagine how people who listened and watched felt about it. I, I mean, when I did that of the late Dora Kunyeli's parents and it was played for her, it was tears all through, you know, and immediately afterwards she came to me and she hugged me for few minutes, you know, and it just, it just made sense to me that be intentional about things you do. Narrating is not just a child's play. Narrating is not about reading books. It's understanding the emotions and the feelings that go with it. And then when it's backed up with good pictures, when it's backed up with good memories, when I say memories, it could mean that we're going back to maybe the, we're, te- we're narrating a story of Let's say we're narrating the story of Obehi, right? And then you, you, we have a script that says Obehi started in a school in, let's say, a state, Uromi, for instance. And we go to Uromi to your primary school, and I'm narrating the story. I'm narrating the story. I'm taking them back to how you started in primary school, then to secondary school. I'm giving them your journey throughout your life at a certain age. You know. It might be a celebration of life, but there there could be compelling stories there. And then taking people back to the memories of where you have been, you know, will make will just it would hit differently. I think that's the right word to use. It would hit differently. That's powerful. It is the most powerful uh, element in the world: information. That is the. Uh, I don't want to call it fabrication of information, so that somebody don't get the negative sense of it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm actually talking of the creation of information. The Americans know that it is powerful. That is why they spend millions and millions of dollars continuously, hundreds of millions every year to create their story. True, true. So do you think the people, the worthy people, the way, because I know, I know some uh, filmmakers in Nigeria, they are really strongly to be able to make the film. I know. Some of them we have invited here in Verona. We have interviewed them. So some of them, I'm still uh, currently in contact with them. It is very hard for them in terms of the finance because to make something really to make something really stand out as a film, you need a lot of money. Don't check it change. You need a lot of money to do it. So, and this money is actually available in Nigeria because we are not poor as people would want us to believe. Okay, all of us are not rich. Only a few people are very worthy. Do you think this worthy individual understand the power? of storytelling, like the power of Nollywood, for example, so that maybe they can invest in him and transform it. I'm talking of millions, several millions of dollars to be invested in the, in the Nigerian film industry. Okay, um, so I would like to just speak based on how I feel or what I think might be. You know, so um, there may be a problem of investments there may be a problem of understanding how they will get their roi there may be a problem of trusts there may be a problem of is this the right sector to invest in what is what's the gain what value will it make to me so there are a lot of factors a lot of people see entertainment as i'm sorry to say a waste of time (laughs) or a playful venture you understand? So, because so, sometimes when we are filming, you see uh, maybe someone who is driving a posh car pulls over to get something, in, maybe in the mart we are filming in, and then you see the countenance. It just, it, it feels like we're doing nonsense to them, you know? So uh, that's because, I mean, most of these people feel, oh, we can't even do anything, you know? I mean, what do they want to really do? So they are Hollywood fans and not Nollywood fans. It will take a lot of conviction. And how do you make this conviction happen? By doing even beautiful movies, even wonderful um, storytelling movies, you understand? It's not just about, I mean, when I say movies, I'm not even exempting any comic movies. No, not at all, because these stories tell a lot. You might just see it as, oh, you want to go to the cinema to laugh, but there's always an underlying um, story or lesson to learn in any of the movies that you've watched. No matter, even if it's a single thing you take out of it, no matter how much you laugh at the cinema or in the cinema, rather. Do you understand? So it would take a lot of conviction. And that conviction is just do right, 
do, make good movies, make quality movies, make good story, um, make good stories, you know, and put it out there. I'm a believer of try to do things first before you seek for assistance, no matter how little. When I started my NGO, I started with my own funds. Do you understand? So I didn't need to write to anybody. I didn't need to write letters. Why am I writing letters to you? You don't even know what I can do. You don't even know my thematic areas. So I need to show you what I can do. I need to show you that I'm actually trustworthy. I need to build some sort of trust around me. I need to build some sort of, you know, connection that will make you know that, okay, yes, this person is here to stay. And this is her capacity. This is what she can do. Okay, so it, it's easier when I want to share parts next year or in or by October to girls. I mean, I've used uh, a certain products, a certain sanitary products over time. And they had to write me on Instagram and say, send us an email to this, send us a proposal to this email and we'll work with you. That's how easy it would be. So work first, let them see your work if possible. You know, um, rather than blow some products, use their products. Let's see it. And then after a while, you can write to them and even, you know, make a link to the last movie you did showing their products and telling them why if you do a bigger one, you would, um, you know, create more awareness for their products. So there are ways to go about these things, but it's conviction. And that conviction starts with you bringing out good things. You were saying that there is this um, uh, problem of conviction or trying to convince those that have the money that they can have a good return on investment if they invest in uh, in Hollywood, for example, or maybe in film, in filmmaking. Um, do, do you think that should be uh, maybe a better way to make this approach? Or maybe like, for example, uh, organizing some... I know that that is the Nigeria board of um, Nigeria Geek of Art or something like that. No, okay, I talk Geek of Nigeria. Maybe some organization okay. like that because if it's an individual, you go to maybe ask for fund, it might be difficult. But if there is organization like that and they seek for fund, maybe it might be a little bit easier. I don't know. I'm just thinking. Do you think Kuna something Afalanya that can is work? An individual. Kuni Afalanya is an individual. Uh, Moa Budi is an individual. Uh, Omoni Oboli is an individual, Uche Jumbo is an individual, but what they did was they created their own stuff over a period of time and then it was easy for them to approach these people with good things they have done to work with them, to invest in their in their business. So you insist that even as an individual, it still can be possible by showing evidence of what you can do, right? Yes, it is. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, uh, looking at uh, the possibility of Nollywood shaping the Nigerian nation, the shaping our own narration as a people, what do you want to say about that? Yes. Um, you know, sometimes we just don't do film or do make a movie for ourselves. We do it because we want to create change and put Nigeria out there. You know, like you said earlier, um, there's someone you know who said... Um, uh, from the storytelling of Nigerian movies, she's been trying to imbibe it into her own storytelling, her own filmmaking. So we do things and then we exhibit our culture. You know, we, we, put our, we put us in a good light out there for people to understand that whatever notion they have about Nigeria is not totally true. There's always a good in everything or in every place. So we have tried or we keep trying and we keep making movies that showcase our culture that showcase who we truly are that showcase what we stand for you know so I, while doing that we are also trying to you know um I'm, I'm trying to look for the word we're trying to also you know push nigeria out there we're trying to also let them know that we are a country you know we also stand for each other and we also stand by each other and we have a beautiful culture as much as we may not have everything a hundred as much as you know maybe the economy is not so wonderful like every other economy is not so wonderful you know uh, but we are trying in our very best we are trying to make sure that we raise that flag high and let people know that we are a place you can visit all right now as a filmmaker as a, a part of the nollywood uh, content creator where do you see the industry uh, in the years to come? I don't know, maybe like in the next uh, 15, 20 years from now. Where do you think it's taking, uh, wh wh what do you see in front of you? In one month, I see us doing a better movie than we did last month. So if we are going to talk about 15 years, we're talking about us creating magic while closing our eyes. 
you know. So <laughs> yeah. So um, if if you read comments, um, maybe on most of these blogs, you see people say, "Oh, this movie they brought yesterday, ah, it was a lot better than the one they brought out, you know, last month or brought out two months ago." So we keep improving. You know, I I mean, I I really wish people understand the 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 energy, the effort that is being put to make a movie. It's not easy. You know, so in 15 years, I'm seeing us doing exploits. In 15 years, I'm seeing us, you know, breaking grounds. You know, in 15 years, I'm seeing that we can win much more outside Nigeria, you know. So sometimes I don't even think most of us do these movies for, uh, because we want to get our words outside. We're trying to do it because we want to create a culture. We want to make people know that we can actually do it. We can actually get better. We're actually trying. We're working. It's a process. You know, so in 15 years, we're making magic. Next month, we're making even bigger magic than we did last month. That's great. I love that. I love the courage. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about your foundation. Tell me more about it. What do you want people to know about the, your foundation? Oh, Clark Cares Foundation is, um, is, is my, I, I, I don't know what the word, what word to you, is my baby. It's it's you see you hear Claire Cares Foundation. It's me. It's who I am. I love to, I love to, you know, help effortlessly, no matter how little it is. I mean, in in university days, I I, I was in a university that had the pilgrimage, you know, so they had um, a place where they housed certain people who could not afford, set, you know, things, and they were taking care of them. I would go and share food to the kids, to the mothers share clothes with my friends you know it started like that and then after school I would go to the orphanage homes to celebrate my birthday and then I included Christmas after a while and then I started to tell friends oh I'm going to the orphanage home if you want if you have stuff to give you know and then I realized over time like I look forward to helping people not just the orphanage I want to know what is wrong I want to know what happened to her? Why is she not working? I want to know, okay, so she got raped. So had anything been done? So I just realized that I could do even more with, you know, bringing it out there. So when I used to do the orphanage home with just a few friends, I just tell friends, and then they come through in, you know, in a very good number, you know, and I tell myself, okay, so if this is done officially, I could reach out to even more people. So let's assume I used to reach out to one orphanage home a year. If I have people come through, if I have organizations, uh, you know, assist us or help us or provide or support or sponsor us, it means we can even do more than one orphanage. There are a lot of people suffering out there. If you go to orphanage homes that are just starting, I know some questions would be, hey, why are they starting orphanage homes if they don't have money to... But these are people who have a genuine heart to help people. They want to pick babies and share with the little they have so that these babies can stay alive because these babies that are being thrown on the streets are babies who would wake up one day who will grow up to be presidents who will grow up to be big people people who will create change in our society you know so i, I made it official in 2018 when i registered the company organization with um cac and then um we started off i started off with a friend uh we did initially it was supposed to be feed 100 and in less than two weeks we got more money to feed um 450 we got to the venue with the food and drinks and all of that. We had to buy more snacks and all because we had quite, we had a community come, you know, and it was so much fun. And then I told myself, okay, so let's do this. Let's work with Zero Hunger. Let's do back to school projects. Let's, let's work with girls. Let's work with boys. No gender or because it's a boy, I'm not going to um, help salvage any situation. Let's pay jam forms for people. You know, and then a lot of people who have worked with me through the years in my broadcasting period, they understand my love for children, understand that this is coming from a very genuine place and this is who I am. And then Clarkes Foundation started in on the 27th of May, um, on Saturday or rather on Friday, we're going to be four years. You know, four years of consistent work, four years of consistent service. We've been able to extend to Ogun State. We've been able to extend to Enugu. We've been able to do projects in Delta, Abuja, you know, and then Oweri. So, I mean, it's one step at a time, one step at a time. And we're grateful for how far we have come. And each year we try to um, pick an orphanage home that we work with for the whole year, provide certain things they need, food, clothes, water, and then um, be there for them. There are regular projects we do with them, 
um, Children's Day, we celebrate with them. Valentine's Day, we celebrate with them. Christmas, we celebrate with them. Back to school project, apart from picking a school in a certain community, we still go to the orphanage home. We work with that year and supply educational materials for them. Thank you for your for your kind heart. In a practical sense, how do you carry out this operation? Is it like you have you are, you have the children that are living in your your facility, or you go to some facility and you rather help to them? I don't understand how it works in a more practical sense. Can you say anything in that, whether you have children in your facility or things like that? Okay, so we're working towards um, having um, a house or a home. Yeah, I think it's better called a home. A home where we house these children. But in the time being, um, we work with communities. So we have project coordinators and state coordinators that we send out. So each, each year, at the end of each year, we have a calendar that we work with. So we know, okay, in um, February, blah, 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 date, we are supposed to do a pep talk in either a school or a community. So these project coordinators will go to communities and look for a community that befits what we want. We're not trying to help people who already have. We're trying to help people who need help. You understand? So they go out to look for these places. And then at the end of the day, we have a meeting with the board and then we sit and say, okay, Let's strike this, let's strike this, let's work with this particular community and create this um, change in their community for this period. You know, then for the orphanage, like I said, we work with one orphanage a year. So it means that we are entitled to providing, um, you know, materials that they need. It could be water, drinking water. It could be uh, fixing their pumping machine. It could be buying them gas for cooking, it could bind them fuel for their generator to pump the water. It could be to provide clothes. You know, randomly people tell me, oh, I have some clothes I want to send to the children, you know, and then I go to and give it to them. And I also have to do follow up on the children. Um, okay, who took malaria medicine last? Who did this? Who hasn't taken this? Who hasn't taken this? And then we work on that and then we do it because we are entitled to take care of them for one year. But while we work towards, we're not in a hurry to create a home because we need to be sure of what we want in the home. Do we need young girls who are pregnant and, you know, are thrown on the street? Or do we need young children who have nowhere to stay and are just hawking? Or, you know, so we need to be very sure. You just don't create a home. These things are things you need to also work you know, alongside with God, you know, you need to just not plan on your own, but also have that in prayer with him, have an agreement with him, you know, understand what he wants you to do and his direction so that you would not just start. And then in the next six months, you're tired because you can't continue because that isn't what you're supposed to do. Thank you for that, uh, Claire. Now, I, I wanted to know some of these children that are out there on the street that don't need help. Um, how did they get there? How did some of them get there that maybe they don't have uh, parents or they don't have guidance and somebody need to take care of them? Okay, so for a few babies, like the ones who are really, you know, little, the day old, two days, those are the ones they abandoned in the gutter. Or sometimes you wake up in front of the orphanage home, you see that they dropped some children there. Now, most of them are there because they were probably born with some form of, you know, deformity. Um, and then, they, of course, their parents may not want to have anything to do with them and just drop them there. Then some of the children you see wandering or having no place to stay, it's either most of them came from the village to stay with their aunts or their uncles who abandoned them or who don't care about them. And these children are tired of how what they go through there, you know, and then decide to just, you know what, let's take our lives Anyhow it comes, you know, as then they just wander anywhere they see, they sleep, anything they eat, anything they see to eat, you know, they just survive as the day passes, you know. So these, this is how, it's a crazy thing when you work in the field because you see a lot of things and you're wondering how this five-year-old is able to survive each day, sometimes not eating the whole day, sometimes eating just once a day because he begged or picked up something to eat, you know, it is crazy, but then. We're here to serve. That is heartbroken. It's not really supposed to be like that. Uh, everybody was supposed to take care of everybody. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> like this full apart had said at a point, we sort of get disconnected and uh, we are pursuing what is done us and we are got it confused. But anyway, thank to people like you that have this a uh, good heart. 
and who are looking around, and not, not looking out there for help, but you are looking inward and looking around you for what you can do and giving a, a happy hand to the people. I really want to thank you for that effort. That thank is a good you. one. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, we have touched uh, different things today. Uh, this one I really be very touching. I really be very important. No? Uh, use this moment to um, appeal to people, maybe how they can reach you, what they can do to support what you are doing. We are actually in a concluding part of it. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I would love you to support, to sponsor in any way, in any capacity you can. I'm personally on Facebook, Claire Azia Kacha. E Z E A K A C H A, Claire without the I, C L A R E. I'm also on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram at Claire Bell, C L A R E B E W -E L Z. Then for the foundation, we're on Instagram at Claire Cares Foundation. You can also get us on LinkedIn, Claire Cares Foundation, or my personal uh, page, Claire Izakacha. We're also on Facebook, same name, Claire Cares Foundation. So these are the ways you can uh, reach out to us. Then you can also go to our website, www.clarecaresfoundation.com. So we'll be hoping to hear from you to support the child at least. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much for what you're doing. All right, now, what will be your last statement here? Because we have touched different things, and I, I want to repeat again the last uh, part related to your foundation, what you're doing is particularly important. So to the people out there, whether related to Nollywood, like we have said, uh, or related to your organization, what would you like to say to conclude it? Please go ahead. Sure, little kindness. I mean, um, we don't know the last day we'll say goodbye. Just show a little kindness. Be nice to people. It doesn't cost a thing. And don't wait to have the millions, you know, before you can help. So even with that five naira notes, 10 naira notes, 20 naira notes. You can help save a child. It might just be a sachet of water he or she needs to drink at the moment. It, just, it might just be a hog he or she needs at the moment. So just try, show some little kindness. And for parents, I would always say um, your presence is needed more than the presence you give the children. So they need you more than the gifts you give them. That's it. Thank you so much, dear. This has really been a very interesting conversation. <laughs> Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead everyone for. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.